This is Sienna, and you are listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. Hi, this is Allie, and you're listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. Right, all right, one to the two, two to the three, in the place to be. It is the King of the Mountain podcast, at least for a little bit longer. If you haven't gotten the news, there is going to be a rebranding going on. This show will be called something else, and the YouTube channel will be called something else. And instead of focusing on just a podcast, it's going to be basically focusing on the YouTube channel. But for the sake of the review, it will have a uh, podcast title. And for the sake of people who listen outside of YouTube, it will still be considered the flagship show, flagship podcast. So for right now, it is the King of the Mountain podcast, but we are rebranding, trying to get up to 200, I'm sorry, 2,500 subscribers on YouTube by Bound for Glory. So if this is your first time listening, first of all, welcome. Second, please hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening on a different platform like iTunes, which I believe is Apple Podcasts now, or Stitcher, or Podbean. Hit that subscribe button. Joining me today, another one of my uh, guest hosts that I talked about the other day on my channel. I told you that I've settled in on a couple of guest hosts that will be here on a permanent basis. So today we got my man in the place to be, Ro the Great. How is your California morning going? Oh, it's going good, man. I'm just recovering from um, a cold and stuff, I guess, so I feel better. And the weather is favorable, but I just found out that in the next couple of days, the heat's coming back. So just trying to enjoy the cool weather. <laughs> I feel you. I feel like we always talk about the weather to kick off the show. Next next thing I'm going to be like, how about them Dodgers? But, um, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> uh, man, I tell you, I was, I'd listen to uh, on, on Kiss. You're familiar with Kiss FM, right? Living out there. Yes. So we listened to that. My wife listened to it on uh, satellite radio and uh, or Sirius, Sirius FM and uh, XM, whatever the hell it is. So she listened to that. And there's a segment Ryan Seacrest does called Ryan's Roses, where they kind of try to catch people. Um, like if some, someone calls in, thinks their husband is cheating on them, they'll uh, they'll kind of prank call them, so to speak, and offer them, hey, you won free roses. You can send them to whoever you want. And they see who they send them to. If it's their spouse or it's somebody else. But we listen to that every day. And every time someone calls in, they're like, we're from Cardina. We're from West Covina. We're from Orange County, L.A. Man, every time I hear the cities, I get so freaking homesick. It's crazy. But I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably be out there summer of next year. So fair warning to you. Well, hey, hopefully, um, you know, if Impact has, is, you know, doing some house shows and actually touring, maybe they come back out here because, you know, last time they were out here was back in 09 and uh, it was a big showing and obviously the company was in a different, um, you know, stage that it is, it is in right now. But, uh, yeah, hopefully they can come back here. And then if you're here, man, you can come chant Impact. <laughs> that would be the ultimate. Absolutely. If you guys are looking for another great, podcast to listen to that covers impact every week definitely check out my boys the heel cast they've been doing this for a long time you just gotta look them up the heel cast do a tremendous job talking about impact each and every week so um check that out as well i don't want to all right we're gonna get into impact wrestling this week and uh before we get into that i do want to put a reminder out there that at pro wrestling tees the shot, the King of the Mountain podcast shirts that are up there are limited time now. Since we're doing a rebrand, they will only be up so much longer. So definitely uh, head over there. Um, just look up King of the Mountain podcast on Pro Wrestling Tees and uh, pick them up before they are all gone. Let's get into Impact Wrestling this week. Uh, man, what did you think of this overall? Before we're, we're going to break this down, obviously match by match and the segments, but. What were your what were you think your your thoughts overall on the show? Um, you know, it was good. I mean, I think as of late, just you know, in my eyes and stuff, I feel like the progs have been well, but I feel like the shows have been safe. I I don't feel like we've seen a lot of uh, chances and stuff like that. So they've all seemed solid. Nothing that really just kind of just popped off my screen. It was like, whoa. 
I will say, though, overall, the booking of Eli Drake and his championship run has been great. And I'm glad that they're really taking the time to really make him be the face of the company. I think what's cool is that right now, so, you know, this past episode, for instance, there were six matches. And a year ago, when Dixie Carter was running the company, we always got four matches. So there was a lot of talking in the beginning. Because Dixie liked to follow the the WWE formula. We're going to kick off the show with the world champion. Um, I mean, how many times was, was Matt Hardy kicking off the show? Uh, Galloway kicked that off a couple times. And he was white bread as they came as a baby face um, talking with the title. Uh, trying to think what other champions we had. Those are the main champions. Um, I don't remember how many times Lashley kicked off the show. But there was just a lot of talking segments, interview segments. You know, it was like obviously it was obvious she was trying to, you know, copy a format that she felt worked. And it just, you know, it made impact hard to get through sometimes. And now we're getting, you know, six matches. It usually it usually consists of like two squash matches. But at the same time, it's uh, what's the new tagline they're going for? Let's talk more action. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. um, We're going to kick it off with the first match. So. They've been doing a really good job with, well, as far as my thoughts on the show real quick, actually, I thought it was um, fairly solid. I, I found myself getting a little bit bored a couple times, and it, which was kind of weird because there was a lot of matches and it wasn't, you know, like talking necessarily, but we'll, we'll get to it. There, there was a couple points I just, uh, the show, I was kind of like almost kind of ready for it to be over when usually <laughs> I'm, I'm very engaged for the whole two hours, but uh, we'll, yeah, we'll get to it. Um so first match of the evening, and it wasn't even a first match. I went out real quick right when the show started, and my wife asked me to get her a drink from the gas station. So I got in the car, and I was back in about seven minutes. And I'm thinking I may have even missed the first match already. And I came back, and Johnny Impact and KM were in the ring talking. So they kicked this one up off of the talking segment. Um, I didn't really – so I, since I didn't really see the first few minutes, did Johnny Impact come out first, or was it KM? Yeah, what they were showing is they were showing uh, uh, Johnny Impact backstage. He was searching for Eli, and then he came out in the ring and cut, you know, a promo just stating, "Oh, I'm looking for you, Eli. I'll be here all night." And then that's when uh, KM came out and you know pretty much addressed Impact, letting them know that, "Hey, you know, we know Drake's uh, in Mexico." And then they just kind of just went back and forth, and uh, that's when uh, they. I don't know if they really established it, but apparently the uh, number one contendership was on the line in this match. Yeah, no, it was established. I remember, um, I think that's what what KM had uh, challenged him to. Okay, so, cool. What, do you, what are your thoughts on KM? I do, actually do like KM. I think, he's, um, I think he's so traditional of a heel, though, that it just comes off as uh, maybe very corny to people sometimes. But, you know, I feel like he's he, he's out there. I'm not going to be Mr. Cool Heel. I, I actually want people to boo me. And he, and he was getting reactions. You know, there was a point where he wasn't really. But, you know, he gets a reaction. So people boo him. But what, what, do, you, what do you think about KM? Um, I'm a fan of his. And um, I really like his uh, innovation of moves. I mean, he does some crazy stuff. But uh, I think he could be utilized better. I mean, you know, like you've stated before, not everyone's going to be world champion, and, you know, I understand that. But um, for what they're lacking, like, say, in the mid-card, maybe a mid-card hill, or even if you have him, you know, facing main eventers, you know, just to give him some, you know, somebody to work with until, you know, the big feud, he could be utilized better. Instead, I feel like, you know, they make him out to look like this big old goof and stuff like that. So that's just my take. I think he'd be so much better utilized in a tag team with Congo Kong. And you're right, he comes off a little bit as a goof. You know, when he was first, when he first came out there with the white dress shirt and all that, and I'm I'm Sienna's cousin, he kind of came out like kind of a bullyish character. And it's almost like he still kind of does the bully thing, but there's there's just a, a, a t tad bit of humor on there that maybe people don't like. But, but I, mean, I mean, I like the dude. I'm not a, I've, I've seen a, I've seen some places that just like absolutely cannot stand this dude. Like he's wasting time on our television. And I don't think so. I, I would like to see him and Sienna not be together because I, I think he hurts Sienna a little bit because Sienna should be a badass. Sienna should be winning clean. 
you know, um, and there's just always that KM factor. So I'd like to see them split up, but, um, you know, I think they can find a better role for him. I could just see him teaming up with a, uh, Congo Kong, or even, even this is, might be out in complete left field, but Marche rocket as a heel, which he is a heel, but, um, they, they got similar personalities in the jokes that they crack and their size and ring work. So I could see something like that working. Maybe they're not going to win the, win the gold. Yeah. He could just, he, he could be better utilized. That's just my take and stuff. I don't think, cause I've seen, you know, people say like, he's a horrible worker. I mean, you know, stage on and stuff. I just think you could utilize him better. Like I said, nobody's saying put the world title on him, but, um, you know, and as you just mentioned right now, you know, talking about a tag team, I mean, I, what's one thing that they're, um, the company's lacking? There's not a whole lot of tag teams. You know, you got your LAX, you got OVE, and then, you know, Garza and Laredo Kid, you know, as of late, Garza has been, um, you know, wrestling singles matches and stuff. So, and then you got uh, Veterans of War. So the tag teams, you know, they do need more tag teams. So why not? And they got Reno Scum floating out there too, which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for these fools to come back. Oh my god! Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I forgot about them. I forgot about them. I, I would have been more excited if they were in a, a program with LAX right now. Yeah. You know, I, I think maybe maybe them being hurt actually helps them. Not both of them, but I know Thorn still got hurt, but now he's cleared. I think that might be helping them creatively because I think they might be good to book against uh, LAX down the line. But um, that's a little little bit off subject. So this first match was KM versus Johnny Impact. I, I didn't mind it, you know. Um, my son, my son goes to sleep not too far after the uh, beginning of the show, and he wanted to watch Johnny Impact. So, I said, "Hey, maybe he'll kick off the show," and I really didn't think he was, and sure enough, he did. So he got to watch him, and uh, it, it was fine. Johnny Impact kind of got his moves in, and uh, you know, K- KM got a little work in too. I was really like, even though I wouldn't call it a botch because it's a very difficult move, but that uh, the. Uh, Flip. He he did he did the elbow for the finisher this time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He it overshot it a delight. little. <laughs> is that what it is Thursday, ugh, Thursday night delight? Yeah, that's what he's calling it, I believe. Okay, I do like how he's getting the fans interacting with him with the five four three two one. That's excellent. Um, and this is where I've talked about this a lot, man. People who come from the bigger platforms know how to get the crowd to do more. They know how to, to maximize the crowd. Even if it's a small crowd, they know how to get them fired up because they're coming from a situation where they had to get a larger crowd fired up. You know, that's why you see a guy like him or Alberto El Patron come in and just, just do really good things with the crowd. But So first, number one contendership was on the match. I mean, on the line, Johnny Impact wins the match. We get Ava Story versus Taya Valkyrie. No, 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 no. It's tonight. I was hoping there was going to be some kind of competition here from Ava. And this was like a butt kicking. Yeah, you know what? It had me thinking, like, is Ava Story, I mean, I know she's a part of the roster, but is she an enhancement talent? And I'm, you know what, we've seen in the past where people, you know, when they really start with the company, you know, maybe, you know, they, you know, lose a lot. Then later on, you know, they get pushed and, you know, become the star and stuff like that. But uh, um, I, I agree with you. I, I was hoping that she'd get more in, but I understand, you know, the big picture. You know, you got Taya, you know, you want her to look dominant and stuff. So it served its purpose on that end. So I, I want to say something about something positive about Ava. I mean, first of all, she's beautiful. She has a great look. Um, I think there's something she can, they can do with her in the long term. But uh, I will say this positive. When she came down to the ring, her confidence level was so much higher than it was when she first debuted. Like she came out and she was very timid. And now she's actually, you know, clapping and trying to get the crowd into it. Has a smile on her face and a little more believable. The one area in the ring... Which, I mean, she's green as grass, but the one area where she, I really feel like is not translating well on TV is her selling, like, the way that, she has this expression on her face. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it's it's not, it's, it's not believable. It's like she's trying to look like she's hurt, but it's not, it's more of like, like a look of constipation type of thing. And I, I don't mean to make fun. Of, <laughs> I don't mean yeah, to make no, fun of her, you but you, you see what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, she she just has this look that's not really not really believable 
How, however, she's she's super green, and you know I think the company sees something here in Madison Rain. I know has spoken very highly of her. Yeah, around around probably sometime next year, you know we'll you know we'll see you know probably better things from her because I forgot when they signed her, but I want to say was it mid this year or was it early this sometime this year? When did she get signed? I think somewhere in the middle of that. <laughs> you know, yeah, see, so she, you know, she has time to grow and stuff like that, so she'll be fine. Yeah, and Ring of Honor was was looking at her too. I mean, she she had a um, there was actually a I don't know if called call it a bidding war or not, but they were both trying to sign her, and she chose she chose Impact. And um, you know, Women of Honor may have a higher profile as uh, right now as you know really competitive women's matches, but they're not a. Um, highly featured part of television for them and you know being a knockout is much higher profile and um so it was good to see her uh wish she wasn't so squashed i, I haven't seen the shine eye pay-per-view yet but i heard um she had a match with sienna and i heard sienna destroyed her so uh yeah hopefully, hopefully we start seeing some more offense from the girl pretty soon um what are you thinking about taya so far so she's beat ava story and amber nova um, what are you thinking about her so far as just as far as what, what what are you getting? Because I don't know how much you watch Lucha Underground, but she's very impressive in Lucha Underground. And I'm not getting that right now after the two matches she's had. What, what do you think? What are your uh, opinions so far? Well, I've I heard of her um, stemming from uh, Lucha Underground. So, you know, when she first debuted, you know, I was interested to see. Um, I have no complaints. I like what I've seen. It looks like they're booking her as a, you know, I don't want to say a monster, but, you know, a big heel and stuff like that. My thing, though, is isn't that Sienna's place? You know, Sienna was supposed to be the big uh, knockout heel. So then now you have this other, you know, one that you're projecting to be big. I mean, is she going to work a program with, you know, Sienna? You know, I, I would think the money is... Uh, um, in her versus Rosemary and stuff. So, but no, I, I, I've been impressed. I mean, it's, she's just going to need to eventually have to work with somebody, you know, have longer matches. You can't do the squash matches forever, you know? So I thought she's been looking really good so far. I kind of want to see her use a different finisher, however, because the, the one who made that pretty popular was Beth Phoenix. And she was very strong, very big and made it look very devastating. And before she hit the move, she was able to lift the opponent, you know, an extra an extra foot and slam them. Um, so it just looked a little more impressive. And Taya's is not as impressive looking. And it looked okay on Amber Nova, looked okay on Rosemary. On Ava's story, not not so much. Uh, it's, I'm not saying it looks bad, but it... It could it could just look more devastating. She's just not getting that extra lift before she um, brings the opponent down. But you're right. You you got to you make a good point. They're almost like hey, we're making her big and bad, but that is kind of Sienna's place as well. And then she's saying, well, she wants that knockouts title. So it's a it's an interesting dynamic with Sienna and Taryn and uh, Taya, where it's almost like they're working together, but they almost don't like each other yeah. type of thing. So uh, very interesting. So after the match, she makes short work of Ava's story, and Rosemary comes out. Rosemary finally has that new look that we have been seeing online, which is it looks pretty pretty cool. I mean, it doesn't. It's definitely not the look that she debuted with. It shows a lot more face, but she's got the green contacts in and everything. Um, I think this is a very good baby face look for her. Um, I've I've always said I kind of like when she's all black. I, I I've never been really happy with all the red that she started introducing in but but this is a really good look for her. comes out and has um some mic time saying that she finds it amusing that Taya thinks she already deserves a knockouts title shot and things get uh things get things get hot Sienna comes down and they're uh they're working over Rosemary and this is you know a couple weeks in a row now uh two or three weeks that Rosemary's looked uh, very vulnerable out there. She used to she used to be booked a lot more dominant looking. She's been looking very vulnerable out there lately. So then Allie comes down. Um, she didn't bring a kendo stick this time. She just came running down. 
I liked her look with the uh, the pants and everything. You notice they had the uh, the matching shirts, her and Rosemary. Mm-hmm. I thought those were kind of cool. I was trying to read it while Rosemary was talking. I know it said something about a bunny. Obviously, that's the picture on the, on the shirt. But were you able to make it out at all? I I, I couldn't. I think I want to say it says Demon Bunny. I'm not sure, but I I couldn't I couldn't see. But I seen the actual the image of the bunny. If those show up on Shop Impact, those things are going to go crazy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. So Allie comes down, and then Taryn comes down, and it's a it's a beat down. And then, of course, Gail Kim comes down as the hero. They always book him. Gail Kim as the hero, no matter what. And it's like, it's so, her, her career is almost up, and it just still feels like the Gail Kim show a little bit. This is Gail Kim's fault. But we're going to miss Gail at the same time when she's gone. I don't know. It's, it's just time to, you know, they have the match graphic for Victory Road and it shows, uh, we'll get into the match here in a little bit. But of course, like Gail Kim has like the biggest photo on there uh, compared to Sienna. So I wish it was Rosemary in that slot, but, oh, but it's whatever. Um, all right. So what'd you think of the brawl overall? Um, I, I thought it was a pretty good knockouts brawl. Uh, maybe, maybe it went a little long, but what'd you think of the brawl? Um, it was fine. I mean, I think it showed me, um, and I guess, it, and I'm counting Gail just as of right now since you know she is you know still with the company, but it shows you the six like the six top con- uh, well, yeah, the six contenders for the title. I mean, I know Sienna ha- is champion, so the five contenders, but um, no, it was fine. You know what I mean? Um, you know that was the one thing we needed to see, like the faces of the knockouts. You know, mix it up and stuff. So. I'm looking forward to see what, you know, they do when when um, they get together at uh, Victory Road. Yeah, I mean, it's a top six knockouts, you know, fair enough. That, and I think that's a really nice top six to have. I really do. But we need to start, you know, um, between Ava and Alicia and MJ. And, uh, you know, we, we, we got to start seeing these guys get out there a little bit more. Even if they want to try to bring on Amber Nova, I, I don't know that she's in the plans or not but there are some young gals that we need we need to start seeing come up because we know that Kira Hogan and Hanaya are in the works as well so um it's a really nice top six but the other girls have to they got to find something for them too and uh they, they're just on the they're on pace to have a very very strong division though I, I will say that so they show a, a clip in Mexico of OVE arriving at the clubhouse, and they won a two-on-two title shot. So last last week, they thought they were going to go to Crash, get a title match. Turned out there was two other teams involved. Do you feel like OVE is being rushed into this title scene? Because, you know, they have three matches up to this point. Two squash matches, which one where they almost lost, it looked like. And then they had a match with uh, Falaba and Mario Bokara. But they haven't really proven themselves and that happens all too often when a new a uh, new team or new wrestler comes into the company and they're right away like I'm here for the title like well duh everyone should be but do you, do you feel like OVE hasn't worked up enough or is it just lack of lack of opponents because LAX has run through everybody at this point so you had to give them something new yeah I think for both of them it's kind of like kind of you could say booked in the corner. I actually forgot about Ba and uh, Bakara, you know, just for the simple fact, you know, the way they're used, they're not used as, uh, you know, title contenders. But, um, you know, you got OVE, they come in, you know, they've run through, you know, a couple of teams. Who's next, you know? Um, we haven't seen any uh, veterans of, of war, um, as of late at least. Uh, Reno Scum, you know, I don't know what's happening with them. I know we were, you said that uh, Thornstow is uh, healed, so there's no one else for them to work with. You would think it is LAX, and then you look at LAX's position, they've beaten almost everybody, so who are they going to work with uh, next? So it would be OV. I just think, or at least hoping, they draw this feud out some. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, for for OVE to already be challenging for the titles and stuff like that, I'd like to see them, you know, extend the feud just, you know, a tad bit and stuff while we get some uh, more tag teams. Right. We've gotten so much, so far away in, in any company of um, building up two teams individually and then having them come to a clash. You know, we instead we build up a match at a pay per view by having them wrestle five or six times, and then have another match at the pay per view. 
So I just think there's more they could have done with L- uh, with OVE. But, you know, they are kind of lacking heel teams. They have chosen not to make Bon Bokara uh, a force. And um, that's where, you know, I really thought that a team like KM and someone like Marche or Kong, something like that could come in and, and have a little little mini feud. And then, you know, maybe make a number one contenders match and, and get up to that. But, um, yeah, so we, we are getting OVE versus LAX uh, next week again. What are you thinking about Global Forged? You, you know, I remember reading about this, that they were doing tryouts. And one, I believe they're picking three finalists. I want to say one is going to be going to Pro Wrestling Noah, and two are going to be developmental for Impact. I think that's what, it's something like that. Of course, in traditional fashion, they have not explained this very well at all. But when, when we first started seeing this, I think it was maybe last week, I thought it was a joke at first. When they are like Global Forged, and then they had a couple of people cutting like super corny promos, I actually thought it was like a joke. Yeah, me too. That's what, that's what I was thinking initially. And then until I, you know, started, you know, seeing, you know, what they were doing in the ring. Uh, I have no problem with it. I mean, anything that, you know, provides kind of like a developmental, you know, to help develop talent. I also think, you know, if they're really serious about it, you know, they could send some of the people that, uh, you know, like say maybe at Ava Story, you know, have her working with some of the up and comers so, you know, she can hone her craft too a little bit. And some of the wrestlers that, you know, that are new, that, you know, relatively green, but I have no problem with it. I mean, you know, new talent, you know, that they're looking for that next um, quote unquote AJ Styles, like they've always say. And I think it's a great program to have because how many times we sit here and talk about, we want people in the company who want to be there, who are not there for a road, you know, a a pit stop. You want, you want a, a group of young wrestlers who say, yeah, coming to impact wrestling is an accomplishment for me and gosh, who can I remember? I mean, who can I, who am I trying to remember? There was a, Ooh, it was on Vince Russo. Someone was uh, talking with Vince Russo about um, doing uh, seminars and stuff at uh, wrestling schools. And they say, Oh no, you know who was, it was Aiden O'Shea actually. And he was saying that everybody in there, 99% of them, their goal is to go to WWE when they start wrestling, which is totally understandable. But he was trying to explain, you know, there's other ways to be successful in pro wrestling. It's not always necessarily about going all the way to the top of the mountain. So you want to you want to try out some kids, some wrestlers who say, hey, yeah, Impact Wrestling, you know, maybe I do want to get higher up one day, but but Impact Wrestling is a huge step up from what I'm doing right now. Uh, you know, there's a local wrestler here that he was a friend of my wife's. That's how I met him. And I was talking to him and he's strictly a local dude. I mean, he's not, he's not going anywhere, but to him, WWE is the only company. Like he, we had a talk about impact and he wasn't very speakingly, very speaking, very highly, highly on it. And, um, I almost wanted to knock his ass out. Had he not been part of a uh, wrestling car, there a guy, a bunch of guys a lot bigger than me, but you know, so I know for some of these young young people, impact's not an option. But we want the ones who who want to be an option. Yeah, it it I think you know my take on it and stuff because I remember when when I used to wrestle um, when I was training to wrestle seven years back. Um, you know, I was probably one of the only ones that you know wanted to go to TNA. That was my goal. But um, I think you know the one thing I will say with WWE. You know, if you go to WWE, even if you don't make it, say they sign you and, you know, whatever happens, I think that being on the resume, it opens doors where, you know, you end up on Impact Wrestling's radar, Ring of Honor's radar, all these other promotions, They it seems like they know of you more than versus if you start somewhere else sometimes and say it doesn't pass away. That's, that's just my, my, my take on it. So maybe that's one reason why, too, outside of obviously, you know, the money and, you know, all that other thing. But I'm with you. I'd rather have people who want to start an impact and want to grow an impact and want to make impact be, you know, like the other company. Yeah, you make you make actually you actually make a very good point there um, for resume purposes. Yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. I saw a, I saw one in the in the 
video package there, Hakeem Zane, which I, I beat his name to death a little bit. I don't even know if people know who I'm talking about, but he's been on Impact a couple times. Saw him at an indie show, and he's uh, he, he said that the he's a uh, Jeff Jarrett actually really likes him and uh, Idris Abraham as a tag team, but Idris Abraham's part of the company. Hakeem Zane isn't, um, but he says he feels like his foot is in the door. So he, is, I know he is trying to work towards a roster spot, and I. I'm going to do my best to have him on the podcast sometime because he's real cool. All right. Um, so we get this tag team match. And, and I don't know what the viewership was for this. I looked it up yesterday, and I, I didn't see anything. So maybe it's going to come out late. Yeah, it went up. It, it went up. Uh, um, I want to say it was 270 thou, But it okay. didn't make the top, the top 150. But because, uh, you know, the Thursday night football game, uh, that was the ratings high. Oh yeah, of course. All right, so at least at least it did go up a little bit. So they're promoting this episode of Impact, and all they're promoting is Ava Story versus Taya, which they knew was a squash match, but that was the main match that they were promoting. And then they started promoting Congo Kong versus Shira, and we're gonna get into that in a little bit. I don't understand why they wouldn't have promoted Eddie Edwards and EC3 versus Pagano and Phantasma. No idea why you wouldn't do that. It wasn't like it was an impromptu match that they threw together. Like, we're sitting there, we're watching this show, and all of a sudden, coming up next, Eddie Edwards and EC3. I was like, holy shit, that's a good match. Why Why the hell didn't you promote that? So, I don't understand that sometimes. Usually, it, it, it uh, re- reflects on the viewership as well when they're promoting matches like no one really cares about. Yeah, it was. Um, it seemed it, they. It seemed more. Uh, I felt like they promoted it more last week than they did actually the week. You know, of you know, since this is when the match was going to be uh, airing and stuff like that. But you know, maybe like you said, you know, with the viewership, they probably figured you know, this would be something that nobody wanted to see. But who knows? One of the problems with the block set of tapings is that they announced. Well, they didn't. You know, Dave Penzer didn't, but. Uh, JB or Josh had said, well, he's the uh, Noah champion, the GHC champion, and he's coming out without a belt. So those are one of the problems with the mass tapings. It would have been really nice to see him come out with that title and uh, it would have really made him seem like a very big deal. But unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. Right. So I, I did enjoy this match. I, you know, It's hard not to with EC3 and Eddie Edwards out there, and I like Phantasma's work a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, me too. I, I thought EC3 being fired up and everything here, I really liked it. I love the way he came out and he was yelling and wanted to kick ass. That's how I felt he should have always come out when he was babyface EC3. But instead he was coming more, I'm going to come dance with the people, you know, maybe joke around a little bit. Like, I liked that energy he had. Like, that screamed to me babyface of the company, uh, what he was doing. Do you think they're going to go back to the baby face with this or? You know what? I really think they should. And I might be the minority. And I know uh, we talked about this in the past, but I feel like the only reason why his uh, baby uh, face one failed was he didn't have that heel. You know, that seen him eye to eye. Now you got to Eli Drake who they're pushing. You know, you could say, you know, it's the number, you know, top heel in the company. Where if you're gonna turn him babyface, it'll work. Cause I feel like this heel run, it kind of in some ways, and I know he's carrying the mid card title, but it, he kind of became like a mid card heel. And honestly, like watching this match, I just felt like the EC3 character, he it feels lost right now. Like there's kind of no sort of direction, you know. After he wins the grand championship, you know, and then you know he went, uh, he beats a uh, Phantasma. He has the one match, and then now like. And, and, and I know um, it seems like the company was going in a direction where, you know, the face and heel, it really doesn't matter as much and stuff. But it was like, wait a minute, you know, this, you know, EC3 is a heel, but, you know, well, I'm cheering for EC3. But, yeah, to answer your question, I think they should, but do kind of like a slow burn. Don't just next week have them all, you know, kind of just mucking it up with the fans and stuff like that. You know, take their time doing it if they're going to do it. Yeah, even when they turn them babyface the first time. He was still kind of heelish. And I remember specifically he was coming down to the ring one time and he looked at a fan and then he shook his head like F it and like gave him five. Like almost like he had to think in my head, uh, 
okay, whatever, let's do this. So it was a nice, kind of a nice slow burn. And they almost ruined EC3 doing the babyface thing before. It's great seeing him do the heel stuff, but if they're going to make him a heel, go, go full heel with EC3. Go back to the suit, get a sidekick, do what worked in the past. I wouldn't be totally opposed to him becoming a baby face if he was just if we saw this version of him yeah, not, I not agree. you know yeah I agree. but yeah I, so i enjoy the match and uh so after the match it's over and um if, so phantasma and pagano win the match eddie edwards he hits the blue thunder bomb which i believe i've been reading is going to be his new finisher above the um boston knee party so I believe it's going to be a blue thunder bomb, but with with some kind of twist to it. I I don't remember, but I believe he's been using using that as at Noah as his finisher. So we'll see. But uh, Tejano arrives, hits Eddie Edwards uh, with a power bomb. Phantasma covers and gets the win. It's a beat down after the match. EC3 rolls in the ring to help Eddie Edwards. So they didn't tease any kind of dissension between Eddie and EC3 at all during this, which was interesting. They did last week, but not this week. James Storm comes down to make the save. And I'm thinking in my head, who's going to make the save? I knew someone would. Uh, without reading spoilers, I have to believe that they're building a three-on-three match um, at Bound for Glory. I just That's just common sense right now is telling me that. So I was like, okay, who's, who's their third partner going to be? James Storm comes down. I'm not a fan of uh, when, you, when you do the run-ins of walking down there as slow as possible. <laughs> you're right I don't like that at all uh, EC3 had done that a lot when he would come down and I feel like even if he doesn't want to save EC3 well Eddie Edwards is out there and then you got these you know guys from another promotion coming in and, and beating down our you know your people I would think that he would come down there running but instead he came down just lollygagging had a beer in his hand just just you know uh, I thought he was never going to get to the ring Cowboy, and it, it looked like this was heavily edited, so it yeah. didn't come a, it didn't come across good on TV. But he went in there, has the beer in his hand still, I believe, and guys come running at him, and he just like sidesteps, like like it's Tom and Jerry or something, Roadrunner and Coyote. I mean, he just sidesteps out of the way, and they go flying out of the ring, basically. And so it happens with two of the guys, and then the third one. It doesn't even show it. It's completely edited out. And then he's just standing in the ring with EC3 and Eddie Edwards. Right. So you you picked up on all that too, right? Just it just looked. Yeah. It it it, it yeah. It, it looked it was like it was heavily edited. I mean, it didn't bother me too much. But I think you know he he was portrayed as like you know a badass, which it, which is cool. I mean, you know, last time we seen James Storm, he was facing a Loki, and then before then it was you know the the concussion. So. You know, it, it it was fine. And the thing that I like, I like the continuity. Like he didn't go up in there hugging EC3. You know, he kind of looked at him like I remember, I remember everything and stuff. And you saw EC3 kind of look kind of puzzled and stuff like that. So I like that they continued that. That that was a nice touch. That was a really nice touch. Um, as opposed to Rosemary, who's all obvious, all of a sudden cool with Gail Kim. Yeah. And, and and vice versa. So um, it is nice to see that continuation. So if they're building towards this abound for glory, this three on three, I would be extremely interested in it. That would be a match that I, I would really look forward to. So I hope that's what they're doing as opposed to in two weeks from now, we get these guys three on three against each other. Let me ask you, what do you think, though, and I don't know about you, but the one thing I hate is when, and it happens with the mid-card title a lot, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, where the champion always ends up at, you know, a pay-per-view, he's in some kind of multi-tag match. I feel like if you're champion, you should be defending your your championship. Now, if he's dropping the title before Bound for Glory, then, you know, fine, but I would prefer to see him in uh, E3 defend the championship the grand uh, championship at uh, Bound for Glory. But, I mean, I'm not opposed to the six-man tag. But, you know, you kind of see my point is as far as, like, you know, him being champion and being in a multi-tag instead of defending his belt. Yeah, go. it adds to the long list of mid-card titles in any company that isn't important or isn't as important as it should be. But I really think the people backstage are really 
spitballing like what do we want to do with this grand championship yeah i'm i'm almost sure of it i'm not uh, you know to be on a to be a fly on the wall i'm not so i don't know but i really feel like they're i really think that's kind of the reason ec3 has the title is we might see a couple grand championship matches but i i could see his personality being the one to turn it into something different i i don't I just don't know who he could feud with at the pay per view over the Grand Championship because they've had they had the Grand Championship match with Aaron Rex and Eddie Edwards a couple years ago at Bound for Glory and it was it was, it was the most it was the worst match on the card. Phantasma maybe I mean I I, I was of the mindset after watching um, the tag that tag match with Eddie Edwards in uh, EC3 versus uh, Phantasma and uh, Piano. Um, I felt like I was like, if there's going to be one guy from one of these other promotions to win a championship in Impact, I think it'd be Phantasma. I mean, you could have Phantasma uh, face EC3 for the belt again. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I could see him, Phantasma, having the title going into the pay-per-view or something like that. But I, I really, I just hope that they don't throw three on three at each other right away because when you've got three on one side, three on the other, um, you know, kind of very similar to the the knockouts, you know, they made a six man tag there, but there's so many little mini feuds you can do here before mm-hmm. the pay per view. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, so I hope I hope that's kind of where they go with it and E C three has to um prove his allegiance to James Storm over the course of this. And, you know, maybe E C three turns on him ultimately, we'll see, but I'm interested in what this in this it has my it has my attention. Um, backstage, so Johnny Impact is looking for EC3. <laughs> it's like, where you at? Not EC3, but Eli Drake. Where you at, you douchebag? Runs into Phantasma and Tejano, and um, and I think Pagano was back there too. But it was funny because he just turns the course like, "Hey, you guys know where Eli Drake is?" Like, like they're his homies because they're from AAA. Uh, when there's obviously a babyface heel dynamic going on there. And uh, Tejano steps up and says, I don't like you in Mexico. I don't like you here. So Johnny Impact, for whatever reason, says, okay, well, let's uh, settle this tonight. I'll even put my number one contendership on the on the line. Uh, why he did that, I don't know, but he did. So we're getting two Johnny Impact matches in one night. But let's transition into Congo Kong versus Maha- Mahabali Shira. Um, I-, I like these guys individually. And I actually think they did a fairly decent job of trying to kind of build towards this because yeah, when they were in India, they had some run-ins. Uh, Shira actually body slammed them in, in India. Um, and that was the only time Congo Kong had ever lost. It was in a uh, main event, uh, six-man or eight-man tag, something like that. And then Shira had uh, come down during the Grado and um, LVN and uh, Joseph Park angle. And Shira had come down. I feel like they inserted Shira here where Tyrus was probably initially. Because remember Tyrus came down? Yeah. And had the, the standoff with Congo Kong. He was doing it when Congo Kong looked like she was gonna, he was going to go after Laurel. Um, it almost looks like, I, I mean, I'm no expert, but I'm almost positive that's what they did here. They just inserted Shira into the situation. And by the time they got around to this match, it was like, why are these two wrestling? Because, I mean, the the standoffs they had was like several weeks ago on the show. Do you feel like, cause this match wasn't fun. Um, do you feel like we, we, that big man versus big man wrestling just doesn't work anymore? Uh, I think it works. If you go about it the right way, the w- thing I took away from this man is clearly, you know, the, a common case of, we don't have a, any idea what to do with either one of these guys. Cause we've talked in the past about Congo Kong, like, it's time to do something with this man. Like we've seen him, you know, squash opponents. You can only do so many squashes and he's worked with Sheeran in the past. And it just, for me, I just felt like, you know, they kind of had something going on with Kong Kong and you could say, you know, maybe with the whole, you know, Tyrus departing that probably mess plans up. Then they have nothing. Then they go back to either the association with LVN or then he faces Shira. You know what I mean? So it's just like, you know, if you're going to, push Kong, push him, you know, there's other people who can work with, or like you stated earlier, you know, tag him up with KM and stuff like that. Don't give us the same match we've seen. The, I feel like these guys have faced each other so many times with Congo Kong beating him all the time. So, 
Yeah, as I said, this wasn't this wasn't a whole lot of fun. Um, Shearer went for a springboard at one point, which we've seen him do, and he could have botched it a lot worse than what he did. You know, I thought the uh, the uh, camera camera angle and everything helped it. He he got enough of it where he was able to uh, collide with Kong, and and uh, you know, props to Kong for for his role in that. But overall, this wasn't a whole lot of fun. The uh, the very the very end of positioning was so bad on 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 Shira being too close to the corner where uh Congo Kong hit the splash and and didn't have a lot of lot of room to jump. I remember back in the days. Um uh, I'm sh- I'm sure you do too. Whenever you we'll use Macho Man for an example cuz he was one of the popular people from the top rope early early on. He would body slam his opponent in the position he needed them to be in. Mm-hmm. Um or if there was a case where that person um you know just kind of ended up on the ground. You walk up, grab a leg, grab an arm, and drag him to the correct position, and then go to the top rope. And Evan Bourne, I'm say Evan Bourne, Matt Seidel does this very well. He never, he never just climbs to the top rope and goes for the shooting star press. He always makes sure the p- person is in the right position to do it. So, this is something in, in wrestling that I think is really, really missing to where. They just try to go with, okay, wherever he's laying in the ring, maybe they'll roll into position a little, you know. It, it's just so much more believable if you just go and drag the guy where you need to put him. Um, I think that's really missing in wrestling, but. Oh, we get a video package with Moose talking about the thing with Lashley. Uh, you know, and I said there was a couple times in this show where I got a little bit bored. Like, I didn't care. <laughs> uh, you know, They've, they've been trying to tease this heat between Lashley and Moose, but they just, I don't want to say they didn't do a good job of it, but we just didn't understand where this heat came from. Now, Moose eliminated him in the Battle Royal, but instead of focusing on that, they were focusing on American Top Team being uh, being upset with him for getting eliminated. And then there was a run-in in AAA where he did the same thing and eliminated him. It's probably done the same exact way. And... Lashley, you know, went, oh, this is my teammate, da, da, da. And then Jim Cornette's like, oh, you know, Lashley, you can quit, but you need to settle things with Moose. I mean, settle what with Moose? Like, we, as a viewer, like, why do they have an issue with each other? I mean, it just. It's all if, over the place. <laughs> it's all over the place, yeah. Um, so when Moose was talking here, you know, oh, we get an update on Moose after getting beat up. I saw this link online, like on Twitter and on YouTube, and I'd even care to, care to click on it. I was like, I, I just. I like Moose and I like Lashley, but I had no interest in this. And I'm not saying I don't have interest in them having a match. I just, this angle's doing zero for me. Yeah, it, you know what? I just think here's the thing. I don't know what uh, Lashley's contract status is in, you know, real life, but if he's leaving the company, the right thing w- would be if if they're going to f- um, face each other at Bound for Glory, I'm unsure, you know, if that's, you know, been confirmed or anything. I hope uh, Lashley puts over Moose big because, you know, in their previous encounters, it's always been Lashley kind of getting the upper hand and stuff because I think, you know, 2018 is going to be the year we see Moose, you know, as a, a world champion and stuff like that. So if he faces Lashley and, you know, looks dominant in beating Lashley because we all know how dominant Lashley's been booked, um, that'll help him, you know, moving forward tremendously. So we get a match of Johnny Impact versus Tejano, and this was from earlier when Johnny Impact uh, challenged them and put his number one contendership on the line. I've never been a huge Tejano fan. I, you know, I've seen him in uh, Lucha Underground, and I, 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 uh, I, he's okay. I, I'm just not. I'm, I'm glad to see him aboard because it's some more name recognition. But I was not. I've never been a huge fan of him. And uh, this was a match here that, again, I was I was a little bit bored on. If you you know, it got a good amount of time, and it it was um, it was okay. It's and it just that I already saw Johnny Impact wrestle once, and then um, again, Tejano doesn't do a whole lot for me. So for this match, I wasn't I wasn't super into it. What about you? Yeah, same thing. I would have preferred, and <laughs> this might be unpopular, but I think it would have made more sense to have uh, Impact. <clears throat> excuse me, Impact face uh, Adonis, because you know how Adonis had attacked uh, Impact last week? 
You know, yeah. I think I think he could have. It would have been a little more entertaining, but that's just me. Yeah, he could have done, um, especially with Victory Road next week. He could have done instead of KM at the beginning. It could have been Adonis. It could have been Adonis in this. You know, it, yeah, storyline wise and entertainment purposes. Purposes, you're absolutely right. Um, Adonis would have been a, a much better choice, but they're obviously trying to build him up as one of the big names of the company. And, you know, what better way to do that than have him have him wrestle twice in one night. And uh, at least that's how they look at it. And he gets the win. And he hit the Starship Pain this time. This time, And um, I don't think he got all of it. You know, that's another that's another move. You know, make sure the guy's on, in position before you do it. But, uh, so we get next week, there was a, uh, back, there was a backstage angle with Karen, uh, Taya, Sienna, and Taryn saying they want to match with, uh, Gail, Allie, and Rosemary. I, uh, I've stated that I, I do kind of like Karen, but didn't she feel like the heel of this segment? Like she always is, man. At, least <laughs> in her, she, at least in my eyes. I, you know what, for me, with, when it comes to her, and I've just come to accept that, you know, she's supposed to be, you know, the one you know, leader of the knockouts or, you know, whatever the association is. But the less I see of her, the better. You know, if you were telling me she is using a segment, like, and I know in this one particular case when they went back there and she set up the match, I'm okay with it. But I don't like seeing her, just for the simple fact, I kind of feel like, do you know how, like, it's a situation where, where okay, I'll just be just straightforward. We know she's only getting camera time because who she's married to. It, you know, let's save it. Even, and, I, and I'm not trying to knock any of her, you know, wrestling knowledge or whatever like that, but that's the only reason why she's on TV and stuff like that. And I think that's just why every time I see her, it's like, okay, you know, if you weren't with with him, I don't think we'd be seeing as much of you. So that's just my thing, but... um. It was okay this particular moment. Yeah, it's just she just came off so heelish to me because I mean, especially since I love Taryn and, and uh, Sienna so much, um, and Ty is cool too. But uh, just the fact they came in and uh, just Karen's like body language and all that. Like last week, Ty let with Karen was great when she like slapped her hand and dragged her out of the chair to talk to her. I mean, that was that was really good. But um, this one, this was okay, but. It's set up a six-man match next week. Taya, Taryn, and Sienna versus Allie, Rosemary, and Gail. And like I said, in the match graphic here, it's all about Sienna and Gail Kim. Like, they're the big uh, faces in there. I I would have rather, like, Rosemary be the, uh, the the focus, but I would have to imagine they're going for Sienna versus Gail uh, at the pay-per-view. That's just common sense. I, I don't really know what they're doing. Could be a multi, multi-woman match. I don't know. But yeah, this is the... Make- so mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. No, I was gonna say this is the match everyone's really looking forward to next week, and let's let's hope it gets time. No, all I was gonna say is I think in this particular case, I know you know we used to always uh, complain with the X Division always doing this, but I think at a Bound for Glory, if they do a multi uh, knockouts match for the uh, championship, I think it's fine. I would even and maybe they don't they probably would be against it because whatever the status of Jarrett, but do a Queen of the Mountain match for the Knockouts Championship and have all of them involved. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think this I think Bound for Glory would be a good good position for a multi women's match because this there's so many uh we've got the top six here and um they're just in a they're in a good position to do that if they wanted to. It would it wouldn't feel like a overkill with me. Like we're at the X division where it's like it's a uh, six-man match for the title, and then you're bringing out guys who haven't wrestled in weeks or haven't even been involved in the title picture whatsoever. But just for all these people to be around Sienna on a regular basis, I think they could get away with it. I'm glad that Karen didn't try to tease a, a, a gimmick because she's done this twice. When when she said, uh, you know, next week you're going to have a match with, with Gail Kim. You know, she didn't say it was Gail Kim. You got a match. She teased that it was going to be a gimmick match. A couple weeks ago when... Sienna and Taryn had a match with uh, who did they wrestle? I guess it was Allie and Rosemary, um, or maybe it was Gail Kim and Allie. I don't quite remember. Um, I think it was Gail Kim and Allie, but anyway, she teased again. You never know what kind of shenanigans or what kind of stipulation, you, you know. It, so it's like 
it's always like, oh, you never know what I'm going to do. And then the match happens. It's a regular match. So, you know, I'm glad she didn't pull any of that this time. Uh, Laurel was in the crowd, and she was dressed completely normal, but she had the, the lipstick all over her face. So it was something to integrate with the crowd and um, engage them a little bit, which was cool. But I really have to wonder where where they're going with Laurel at this point. Because this is we're talking about the top six knockouts. I mean, she's right up there with them. Exactly. That, so... I mean, that's why this, this division is looking so good, but it's, um, you know, right now she's kind of doing her thing, but she, she easily could be, be up there and, you know, w- with these, with these women wrestling. Mm-hmm. So main event of the evening, we're getting Eli Drake versus Mascara de Bronce from AAA in Mexico. And I'm thinking, and I'm sure everyone else is that we are getting a match similar to the OVE and LAX one and uh, similar to like when the Hardys were in other companies and all that, where it was just, you know, piece together moves. We actually got this entire match, um, the whole thing in entirety. And we had JB and Josh calling it. So what did you think about this as the main event? Maybe not so much as the main event, but being able to watch this in its entirety. Personally, this was my favorite match on of the entire show. Um, I might be the minority, but uh, yeah, I liked I liked the fact. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, when they had uh, the the fatal four way tag team match, uh, you know, last uh, ep- uh, Impact, you know, with uh, o- OVE and uh, LAX, and I forgot the two other teams. I mean, it was fine, but sometimes you like to see a full match, and I like that. You know, not only that they showed us a full match, but um, the way Eli Drake looked in it, like he looked like a dominant champion, like the face of Impact Wrestling. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I thought too. I mean, um, watching the match, I'm kind of waiting for this guy who's not built, doesn't look like a star, but I'm kind of waiting for him to get, you know, some kind of offense in or something. And, and for the most part, it was kind of a squash match, but I think it's really important um, to see this kind of match to where it's, you see a, a larger venue, a larger crowd. And it's just a different vibe. I mean, I, I freaking loved it. And I, I think me, I'm Hispanic. So when I see, um, I can watch like the crash or triple mania or, um, you know, say I'm watching Lucha underground and they're speaking Spanish and all that. Like that just stuff feels like natural for me. Uh, you know, I kind of grew up watching Lucha Libre a little bit too. So it felt really natural for me. You know, maybe, maybe some people watch this and they just don't like it at all, but. I, I enjoyed it. I, I really did. I, I, I love different. I always say I like when people take a chance and do something different. So for me, this was kind of cool. I thought it made him look like, like a star, like a main eventer. And, you know, he's getting legit heat. And it, it was just, I don't know, it was just entertaining to see Eli Drake in that setting. Yeah. And so. you know what's what's cool and where it comes to show you, too, because I feel like the work that they've done with Eli since they decided to make him champion like they really rehabilitated, you know, his uh, character because, you know, in the past he was, you know, being misutilized and stuff like that. Uh, I think at one point I want to say, did he lose to Shira? I forgot. I don't know. But um, it just comes to show you, you know, it, a lot of these guys who are being misutilized right now, if they really take the time and, you know, invest in some of these guys, you can re- really fix a lot of these uh, performers and stuff. And um, with the work they're doing with Eli, I mean, I'm going to tell you something whenever they decide to have him drop the title, who they have him drop the title to is going to be very important because if they mess around and mess up and let say, you know, go back to what they've done in the past where somebody from another company comes in and wins right away, all that hard work they've been doing, building Eli and making him great, a great champion, it's going to, you know, be thrown out the door, you know? That's just my take. Yeah, it's going to go right out the window. You're right. It's got to be it's got to be a big deal. But he needs a long title reign. He has to have one. And I think Eli Drake is a great example for wrestlers who might be disgruntled because they might not be doing a whole lot with the company. And you and I, we talk NBA all the time. How many times are there, is there a player that, you know, they're not getting a lot of playing time, but they say, hey, I'm, I'm just waiting for my number to be called. If I, go to, if I got to go out there for three minutes, it's, it's going to be the best three minutes I got. Or there's a player who's disgruntled and it's probably never going to get an opportunity because he's disgruntled. And sometimes that player who's just waiting on his number to be called, but being a good soldier in the process, sometimes that number does get called. 
and sometimes there's an injury. Did you ever watch uh, Michael Red play on the Bucks? Uh, you know what? When I started following the NBA, I think he it was kind of he was still on the team, but he had he was on the downside of his career. I think okay, you yeah. Know, but I, I'm familiar with who you're talking about, though. But but he was a you know second round draft pick, hanging out on the bench. There comes an injury or a trade or something like that. Dude steps up and in his prime, even though undersized, ends up becoming one of the best shooting guards in the league. And that's kind of you know we see that in the NBA quite a bit. Someone gets injured, the backup steps up, and whoa, we got a new star on our hands here. But if that if that person was to sit there and, and just be the scrunt all the time and fuck this, I'm going to another team, you know, like where the guys are, oh, I'm going to another company, you know, the grass isn't always greener than if you just you just wait your turn, wait for your number to be called, and then, you know, run with the ball once they give it to you. So I think he's doing a great job. And uh, next week should be a lot of fun, uh, the victory road. Again, it's kind of weird that it was the knockouts, knockdown name. Um but that's just uh, what TNA does. I'm throwing the <laughs> TNA, <laughs> you know, that's just what they do. So, um, but yeah, overall, very solid show. It just, it had a couple points. I just, you know, I got kind of bored versus in the uh, Tejano match with, uh, with Johnny Impact, the uh, Congo Kong and Shira match didn't do a whole lot for me. And, um, you know, I, I was kind of, Again, with James Storm, kind of wish he kind of came out there with some fire. And um, but other than that, cool. I mean, I think my biggest takeaway from this was I, I, I like the last match, and then um, I like what they're doing with the knockouts a lot. Oh, they haven't put this kind of focus on the knockouts in a while. Now we just got to get the knockouts, the good knockout matches. That's what we're missing. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no, I, I agree with. We we just haven't been. Um, you know, it's like they're getting a little bit more time. The uh, creative has been great for the knockouts, but it's okay. How are we going to get back to those those classic knockout matches? But it'll it'll, it'll get there. I just think you know, with um, you know the arrival of Taya and you know the inevitable departure of Gail Kim, um, they're just working things out. I think after Bound for Glory and stuff like that, they'll really get you know, things situated. And, you know, like you said, like what the the one thing and you know, earlier when you were mentioning you were thinking it's gonna be Gail Kim versus Sienna, whatever happened to, you know, Gail Kim and Terrence Burrell, remember that? Like they gotta when when they start some of these angles and stuff like that, there needs to be some continuity. You know, I don't wanna see, you know, they're beefing one week and then a couple weeks later, like, hey, what's up? You know, kinda like remember you were talking about with um uh, EC3 and Moose after EC3 uh, beat Moose for the uh, Grand Championship. So, but it should be fine though. I think moving forward. Yeah, hopefully they can rec- recreate some of that magic with Gale and Tail, uh, Gale and Taryn. Um, I would imagine they at least have to have a one-on-one match before the pay-per-view. Maybe it's in the, um, maybe the tapings after in Canada. But I think this is a really good thing. We got a lot of Canadian talent on the roster, and Bound for Glory is going to be there. Um, you know, the dirt sheets are saying, oh, well, they're selling tickets. I don't know how many people are going to show up. Like, I, I think the fan base is pretty strong there. And with so many of the talents being featured from there and, um, you know, even Lashley, who, who, who was a big draw when he competed in Smash Wrestling not too long ago. So I think good things are going to come for Bound for Glory. Um, that's going to do it for the King of the Mountain podcast this week. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is the last week that it's called the King of the Mountain podcast. Uh, I think I will have this rebranding situation kind of done by by this time next week. But uh, thanks for listening. This is BQ and Roe the Great. And uh, hopefully next week you're going to get a three-man show of um, myself, Roe, and Adam as, uh, as far as the uh, main team going forward doing this podcast. But thanks for listening. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already on whatever platform you're listening to. And... We'll talk to you soon. Peace.